Mr. Coates, and this is uh, APES lecture number 28, Nuclear Energy Basics. Our last type of uh, non-renewable energy we're going to talk about in class is nuclear energy. And so this first part about nuclear energy is, energy is just about um, how nuclear reactors work and also uh, some of their downsides as far as the waste is concerned. Uh, this particular shot here is of the Fukushima reactor in Japan, and uh, this is a famous reactor now because it uh, had some problems in the uh, tsunami of 2010 uh, basically caused this reactor to have a partial meltdown and so the reactor buildings this is one here there's another one here that's uh, another one here as well uh, basically were all damaged in small nuclear explosions and so this reactor right now is sh uh, in the process of shutting down. Uh, it takes a long time to shut a nuclear reactor down and to get the radioactive uh, material out of the reactor. And so they're still in the process of doing this. And this happened, like I said, in 2010. Now, if you look in here in the foreground of this picture, you got all these little uh, casts. And these aren't that little. These are actually fairly large. And right now, because uh, they're, the reactors are shut down, but the fuel rods are still really, really hot. And so the only way they can cool those fuel rods is with water. And so ever since the accident, they've been pumping water into the reactor and trying to cool it down. Well, what happens after a while, this water becomes radioactive. And they can't just release this water out into the ocean right here. So what they've been doing is that they have been storing all this water in these barrels on site uh, for all this time period and it's creating quite a problem for uh, the Japan uh, company here that's trying to deal with this radioactivity and uh, there's problems with these barrels leaking and some of the radioactive water getting in groundwater and so there's all kinds of problems associated with trying to get this problem under control. It's still not a control and it may be another 10 years before uh, they totally have this under control. It's been a big mess. So nuclear energy, although it sounds great, it has a lot of drawbacks. And so we're going to look at uh, some of the drawbacks, but first let's find out a little bit about nuclear energy. All right, so we're going to talk about typically a conventional uh, nuclear power plant. There are some other types of power plants out there, but we're going to look at a conventional one right now. What happens is that this power plant, the, the job of the power plant is to control the nuclear fission chain reaction. Now, if you don't control the reaction, what you have is obviously a nuclear bomb. But in this case, they control that reaction so they can heat up water, which turns a turbine, which turns a generator, and produce electricity. So just like uh, the coal fire plant, the uh, power generation part is the same. It's how we heat the water. How this works is that we have uh, uranium here. And uh, they use uranium in most reactors. Sometimes they can use plutonium as well, but uranium mostly. And what they'll do is they'll bombard this uranium atom with a neutron. And this causes the atom to split. And when the atom splits, we get a lot of energy out. And uh, in a nuclear reactor, this energy is in the form of heat, which heats up water. In the process, more neutrons are given off that can go and split other uranium atoms. All right, so you can have this huge chain reaction that happens. Now, the key is to control this. We have our uranium atom here, and we use uranium-235 in, re in our reactors. It is the isotope of uranium that you know, works best for uh, nuclear reactions. So and then we bombard it with a, um, a neutron here, and so that breaks it up into other atoms, smaller atoms, which are also radioactive, but also releases more neutrons that can go and break up other atoms. Now these are called fuel assemblies. So this whole thing, this area here is called a fuel assembly where it has all of the little uh, uranium rods inside of it. Now in between the fuel assemblies you have what we call control rods, which are these things. These are typically made out of some kind of neutron absorbing material. Graphite is a good good one, but uh, basically they absorb neutrons so they don't let some of these neutrons to get through. And so by raising and lowering these fuel rods into the reactor, they can control the rate of reaction because it blocks neutrons. And so this will also speed up the reaction or totally stop it after a while. This is how we control a nuclear reactors for our energy source. Now obviously if we don't have these control rods or something happens to them, then we have problems because we have no other way to stop this reaction. And when that happens, it gets too hot in here, these rods start to melt, the uranium rods start to melt, everything starts to melt in the reactor, and we call that a meltdown when that happens. 
because it gets so hot. All right, so here's our nuclear reactor. And uh, so here's our main reactor here. And uh, so here's our control rods. These are our control rods here that go up and down. They have fuel rods are in between here. And then this whole area is surrounded with a moderator. And the moderator is what actually takes up the heat. And in most nuclear reactors, we use water. So there is a main coolant loop, okay? And this main coolant loop takes this hot water or hot moderator and turns it through this heat exchanger where heat is given to the secondary coolant, which is this part here. And the secondary coolant then turns to steam and once again turns our turbine and turns our generator to produce our electricity in this case. The steam then can be uh, uh, condensed again and this might go out to some kind of uh, cooling tower or other water source. And uh, then uh, the condensed water is pumped back into and then exchanges heat with the primary coolant again. And so by having this type of system, we have all the radioactive stuff on this side of the reactor and the non-radioactive stuff is on this side. So this is all the stuff that can cause problems. So when a nuclear reactor fails, usually it's in the coolant side of things. Either the primary coolant pumps or the secondary coolant pumps or something fails. And we stop getting coolant to the center of the reactor and this causes a meltdown. And when these rods get so hot, it'll burn this containment chamber here and then it'll slowly burn through the entire containment chamber here as well as here and create other explosions uh, that can basically blow this whole containment chamber apart. And so that's a bad thing. We don't want to lose our coolant. And in every nuclear disaster that's ever happened on the planet, uh, the main cause is because of loss of coolant. And we're going to look at that a little bit closer when we look at some of our case studies on nuclear accidents. Now, when we have a nuclear power plant, we end up with waste. And the important thing to realize is that this waste is not easy to deal with. A lot of the waste has a half-life of under on the order of hundreds of thousands of years. So what do we mean by half-life? Half-life is the amount of time that it takes for a nuclear material to lose half of its radioactivity. Nuclear material decays and turns into less radioactive material. And in the process, they emit their radiation typically in the form of neutrons or beta power particles or gamma particles in this case. And they form a different isotope. So our fissionable uranium here, 235, it has a half-life of 710 million years. That means if I have a pound of uranium enriched uranium-235, it will take 710 million years for that to be half as radioactive as it is now. 710 million years, that's unfathomable to think about in a human lifespan. It's just unbelievable amount of time and we can't account for that. All right, so what are some effects of radiation exposure? Because if we have a meltdown or we have somebody exposed to some kind of uh, radioactive accident or something, there's gonna be some kind of effect to that. And the main one is genetic damage. Radiation is very good at mutating DNA. And when you mutate DNA, you change the genes and you change the way cells work. So you can create cancers very easily if you uh, mutate those genes that regulate cell growth. And then these defects, if they uh, happen in the sex cells or the gametes of the individuals, you can pass these mutations on to offspring. And so you get damages to uh, your chromosomes, which are this somatic damage here. You get some damages to tissues such as burns. You can have miscarriages and, of course, cancers, leukemias, things like that. This is um, a table here of some of the uh, cancers that had caused after a nuclear accident in Ukraine. And we'll talk about that in a minute. That was the Chernobyl uh, accident. And you can set, see um, by looking at the years, these are years here, and this is the year that Chernobyl happened. And uh, Chernobyl is in Ukraine. And you can see that um, after uh, like uh, almost uh, eight to 10 years in this area right here, Okay, we had lots of instances of cancer in children, um, and this is basically because of these issues. So we had this huge spike of cancers in these areas due to the radiation leaked from the Chernobyl reactor. And uh, often there's a lag time between the accident and the actual time we see a lot of these cancers.
So what type of radioactive waste do we have out there? Well, we have low-level radioactive waste. Now, this waste does not come from nuclear reactors. This waste actually comes from things like hospitals, and it gives off low amounts of radiation. Some power plants give off low amounts, and so this would be low-level radiation, but hospitals, universities have uh, radioactive samples they use for teaching purposes as well. And so um, most of this can be dealt with being placed in a landfill properly. Uh, it's usually not very harmful. So this is not big time stuff. Barium is, is one, for example. Barium is used a lot in the uh, medical field and it's uh, used to trace uh, as a tracer in your body so you can take x-rays of your digestive system and it shows up in your x-ray. And so barium ions are isotopes are often radioactive, but it's very low level. Okay, then we have the high level radiation. This is the stuff that comes from our power plants and from our um, uh, nuclear weapons facilities and we saw the half-life of uranium before and uh, even the waste. Uh, when we use a uh, nuclear reactor we have radioactive waste. That radioactive waste can be radioactive harmfully for 10,000 to 100,000 years and try to uh, explain that to those people that are going to be living in the, that time is that we did nothing to avoid this type of waste and they still have to deal with it. I mean, your grandchildren's children are going to have to deal with the waste that we are producing today and even their children are going to have to deal with it. And there is no single agreement about safe methods of storage of this stuff. So what are some of the ideas that have been put out there? These are some of the far-flung ones here. First, bury it deep underground. Okay, So that's usually about the best one. The ground is a very good shielder of uh, radiation. Um, there are some problems though. You've got to obviously have some earthquakes. Um, you could have the radiation sinking into groundwater and then we could be pumping the groundwater under our crops or into our houses to drink. So that could be a problem. Some people say shoot it into space and so it goes into the sun or so we don't have to deal with it. It's very expensive to send things into space. We can't send a lot of it at once into space. Um, and if there's some kind of accident, that uh, the radioactive substance gets spewed out over a large area. And so that's not a very good idea. Um, somebody said bury it under the, Antarc the Antarctic ice sheet. Nobody lives down there except penguins. Why not put it there? Well, we don't know how long the Earth is going. The ice is going to stay there in Antarctica because of climate change, and so eventually the it might go away, and so that could be a problem. Um, plus, I mean, we've all agreed on a global scale that Antarctica is a uh, world uh, research site. It doesn't belong to anyone, and therefore it probably should be taken care of and not being uh, trashed. In the United States, our most likely plan here is to store it underground, and the United States government has built a huge facility called Yucca Mountain in Nevada, and it's a huge underground facility under this mountain, and uh, it's top secret, but basically uh, they're going to truck and train to this facility from all the nuclear reactors throughout the United States. Well, I hope that answered some of your questions about nuclear energy and